Okay, so um, we are picking up where we left off uh, yesterday, but uh, I thought it would be useful to just give a slight uh, orientation again. So, uh, so here we go. We're looking at uh, the sources and uh, the methods of uh, old Chinese reconstruction. And in terms of sources, we talked yesterday about the rhyme tables and the rhyme books. And then today we'll talk a little bit about early poetry and the structure of the Chinese script. Uh, and so that's what we're, uh, what I'm going to go into now. And then we'll, we'll talk about methods. Okay. So if you look at, uh, one of the odes in the book of odes, as it, you know, uh, I don't know, as you will find it on the internet or in Song Dynasty print versions and, uh, read it, uh, using the, you know, uh, pinyin pronunciation of Putonghua you will be able to tell that uh, it's intended to rhyme. Yeah? So if we look at here in the second stanza, you have duo and luo rhyming. And in the third stanza, you have jie and xie. So it's clearly intended to rhyme. Uh, but uh, in the first stanza, you see that cai and yo are rhyming. And that doesn't seem like a very good rhyme in, in Putonghua. So I think this is a, a, a good sort of point of departure in terms of saying, you know, despite everything that's happened in the last uh, 3,000 years, uh, historical phonology is sufficiently regular that you can still tell these poems are intended to rhyme. Uh, but uh, they, they don't necessarily, uh, well, of course, no surprise, they don't rhyme everywhere you would expect them to. So a theory of Chinese historical phonology would improve uh, these uh, rhyme patterns. And then to some extent, it's a question of taste, how far to push that, you know? Sometimes maybe rhymes weren't perfect even in the original. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyhow, it's, it's, a, it's an important source of evidence for uh, what things sounded like in the old days. It's a question of genre, basically. And in Old Chinese, uh, uh, let's say, when we say Old Chinese, we really are talking about the poems in the Book of Odes. And in the Book of Odes, there's a certain amount of um, um, variation in, in, in different parts of the Book of Odes. So some, some uh, poems don't rhyme at all, uh, but what you see here is probably the most frequent pattern, which is that, uh, I mean, I'll say it uh, in, in a way that, that you, you will find uh, paradoxical, but then I'll caveat it, uh, that the end of the second and fourth line rhyme. And then you say, well, look, uh, in this case, it's not the end, yeah? Uh, uh, and the issue there is um, that there are certain words, certain morphemes that are considered to not be counted. And uh, zhi, which is what, you know, you see here, uh, isn't counted. So, I mean, like, <laughs> why did they do it that way? Well, that's a, a question that's, that's hard to answer. Um, so, so the, the reason I chose this poem is actually because it's Baxter 1992's poem. And what's nice about it is you see that the, uh, the first and the third lines repeat exactly. So we can just sort of totally not worry about them. I think that's why this seems like a good example to pick. Because uh, sometimes you get rhyme also in the, you know, between all the lines of a stanza or, or there can be quite complicated patterns. So actually, um, I, it's, I'm not going to go into it in this course very much, but uh, understanding what the rhyme scheme of particular poems are is also one of the kind of um, um, moving parts in Chinese historical phonology, where um, you can imagine that you know, in one proposed reconstruction scheme, 
in one poem, you'll get different rhymes than in another reconstruction scheme. So one of the things that people can argue about is, um, is exactly which rhyme patterns are intended. Oh, so here's like, let's, if we just limit our world to this poem, what I would say is we both agree that the fact that that tsai tsai fo yi rhymes with tsai tsai fo yi is not interesting. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to tell us anything about uh, Chinese historical phonology. Uh, well, similarly, the fact that sort of zhi rhymes with itself is not interesting. So the 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 fact that duo rhymes with law and the jie rhymes with xie can suggest to us that tsai and yo maybe should rhyme. And I think you should take it that way. It could be uh, that that's incorrect, right? That's that's uh that's a hypothesis. And it's also, let's say, a hypothesis that can't be, you know, uh, proven in a sense because we can't ask the author of this poem, did you intend to rhyme, you know, this and this, uh, but uh, but you can um, pose it as a hypothesis and then see whether uh, these two characters rhyme in other poems or, you know, you can see how the analysis of this poem in the two ways that we see as possible, which is assuming that these two words did rhyme or assuming that they are not intended to rhyme, can interact with other hypotheses. And now the structure of the Chinese script. So this comes a little bit to, you know, the na nature of writing and its relationship to um, to speech. Uh, but they're, 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 although they're very opaque, there are indications of pronunciation in the Chinese script itself. Uh, here we will, I will look at uh, this <clears throat> Shisheng series built on this character that you see in front of you, Bie. And what's a Shisheng series? It's all of those characters that share a phonetic determiner to use uh, Boltz's um, terminology, which I think is good. So we have the kind of origin point for the series, Bie. Uh, and then we have other characters and you see, these are the middle Chinese pronunciations, you know, if you looked at them up in the Guanyin, right? And you see that they're all kind of similar. Yeah, they all start with labials and the, the rhymes are either a ah or e, eh, yeah. So, um, so there's clearly a, uh, a, a, you know, given parameters of variation in terms of what uh, characters that share a phonetic determiner have in common in terms of pronunciation and what they, you know, what they don't have in common. So uh, <clears throat> the kind of basic methodological working assumption uh, that all of Chinese historical phonology builds on is the Shesheng hypothesis which was articulated by uh, this guy uh, Duan Yutsai, uh, who's a kind of you know, big, big hero in uh, the history of Chinese historical phonology. And he proposed that characters with the same uh, phonetic determiner are used to write words that would have rhymed in uh, the language of the Shijing. And as I said, this is the cornerstone of all progress in Chinese historical phonology. I will talk about it a little bit more so that you have a, a good sense of kind of what it means, you know, for, uh, for Duan Yutai and for us, uh, which is that, um, uh, let's just think about uh, the pieces of the claim. Characters with the same phonetic component write words that would have rhymed in the in the Shijing. So if we look at a series like this, it means that I'm, I'm trying to think of like what's evidence and counter evidence for this hypothesis. If the first and the second character in this series rhymed in a particular poem in the Odes, that would be positive evidence of. Uh, of uh, Duan Yutsai's idea. 
Um, but of course, if uh, two characters in this series occur in different poems in the Shijing or don't occur in the Shijing at all, then it's not relevant, right? So that's why I, uh, I, it's phrased as would have rhymed in the language of the Shijing rather than rhyme in the Shijing because you'll have all kinds of, you know, just sort of holes in the data, if you like, yeah? Uh, and similarly, most of the rhymes, many rhymes in the Shijing won't involve characters from the same Shisheng series be because for one thing, they'll, you know, all of these uh, words are some kind of ba or bie, yeah? Pa, pie. So you you would expect that they would uh, rhyme with something like ka, kie, yeah? But those would be from a different uh, Shisheng series. So that's the... Yeah, so I sketched that a little bit in terms of uh, uh, also I think why it has to, in a sense, remain a hypothesis, a sort of methodological research program, is that um, th there definitely are a lot of examples in the searching of uh, words from the same Shisheng series that rhyme, which is why uh, Duan Yusai came up with this idea in the first place. Uh, but uh, you know, there's no way to prove it just in terms of the, the available evidence. There's, you know, in one way to think about it is if we had an infinite supply of old Chinese poetry, then uh, at the limit, uh, all words that are written with characters in the same Shisheng series would come up somewhere in rhyme position uh, in such a way that they were connected with each other, in, in, that they rhymed, yeah. Uh, but of course, we don't have an inf infinite supply of of, of Chinese uh, poems, so uh, so uh, so we have to live with what we have. Those are tones, and this is part of um, of Baxter's system for writing Middle Chinese. So the uh, so so Chinese has four tones. If there's if there's no capital letter and no consonant, it's the level tone. So let's say the first character is in the level tone. And um, the uh, second character with the final X, that's the, 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 the sorry, I just get these, that's the shang shang, so the rising tone. Uh, and it's believed to come from probably a final glow stop. And that's why he, he sort of ch chose this way of writing it, is it sort of, uh, you know what it means is in Middle Chinese this is the 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 shang shang, but it sort of is a convenient representation for what we think it probably comes from in Old Chinese. Uh, and then similarly, the final age uh, refers to the uh, the chu shang, which is the the entering uh, tone. And, and oh, sorry, not the, the entering tone. It's the the. Someone help Falling. me out here. Uh, falling, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the entering tone is is the fourth tone, which uh, which let's say from a kind of default perspective outside of East Asia, you wouldn't understand as a tone at all. You would just call it a closed syllable. So things that end in K, P, and T are called uh, entering tones. Well, yeah, but I mean, aren't you're getting, uh, <laughs> we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, aren't we, right? Like, um, um, the, uh, so, so Duan Yutsai had a hypothesis that is extremely influential methodologically, which is that two things in uh, the, in, in a Shesheng series would have been able to rhyme in Old Chinese. Now, one issue that we will come across, the sort of the last question was also about, is like, what does it mean to rhyme? Well, it means it it it, it tells you something about phonetic similarity, uh, but also is a cultural thing, right? Like, uh, um, there's a famous example that that I won't be able to to bring to mind, uh, but where Goethe systematically rhymes things that don't rhyme, kind of let's say they are not phonetically identical in terms of vowel in modern German, but but because Goethe probably, I think people say in his dialect, there was a there was a merger uh, of those two vowels. 
Uh, but because Goethe did it, it's just considered like anyone can do it still. You know, you can rhyme those two things, even though they don't rhyme. So I think uh, we always have to be aware of uh, in, in rhyme um, as, a, as a poetic practice that there's one element of it that has to do with, let's say, real phonetic similarity. And there's one that has to do with, um, with uh, cultural convention. So the question is, you know, maybe the, let's say, maybe the this last word is not part of this series, but part of like, uh, let's say, another sub-series that's built on uh, one of the characters here. So I, I think this is an extremely important point um, that unfortunately uh, we're going to basically ignore and the discipline largely ignores which is to say there are several books. The most uh, famous one is, is, is Carlgren's Grammatica Serica Recensa, where he says, okay, we're gonna organize all Chinese characters into about 1200 of these uh, series. And subsequent developments in particular, Axel Schussler's book, uh, which sort of updates uh, Carlgren's, says like, no, some of these should be combined uh, or some of them should be split but has the same approach, which is to say, there's only one layer of analysis. Two characters are either in the same series or they're not in the same series. In reality, it's more complicated than that, that there's, there's, there's uh, it's like a network where one character is at the sort of center of a family of things built from it, but each of those can be uh, at the center of their own families. Um, this is, I think, one of the areas where, uh, where a lot of progress in Chinese historical phonology is still possible. And Matis List and I have explored it a little bit in a paper that came out, I think, a year ago. Uh, but uh, we've, it's, it's just a kind of proof of concept to, to sort of look at how you can represent these things and test different um, hypotheses. Um, but it's, it's really an area that needs um, more work. So, uh, so thank you for drawing it to our attention. Okay, now we're going to move on to methods. Uh, so, yes, okay. So this is kind of a, a guide to, if you want to reconstruct Old Chinese, you know, in, in, in the manner that it has been reconstructed so far, how do you do it? So you get your hands on some middle Chinese uh, like using uh, rhyme books and rhyme tables. And then you internally reconstruct that language. So, you know, you just look for asymmetrical patterns and kind of hypothesize how, how m might this language have um, been in the past. And you kind of reward yourself for those internal reconstructions that improve the rhyming in the shirjing, and you kind of punish yourself for those internal reconstructions that do not improve uh, the rhyming in the shirjing. So then you end up with this kind of internally reconstructed Middle Chinese that improves the rhyming in the shirjing. And then you uh, bring in the Sheisheng series by bringing your, your analysis of the Sheisheng series uh, with respect to, to the shirjing into conformity with the Sheisheng hypothesis. So putting it another way, like uh, you, you, or just, yeah, put, yeah putting it another way, you develop ideas from within Middle Chinese in such a way that they improve the rhyming in the Shijing, and then you kind of test and refine and expand those ideas by seeing what they do to Sheisheng series. So that's how we reconstruct uh, Old Chinese, basically. So uh, now I'm going to go through those. So you get yourself some Middle Chinese. So we come up with initials and uh, divisions in the rhyme books. Now I'm going to go you know, through this, and this will rely on what we talked about yesterday. So if you want to know what the initials are in Middle Chinese, you find these uh, these 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 uh, 
chains of Fangqi initial spellers. As I, I mean, if, if, if you end up lost, uh, let me know. But uh, we talked about before when you spell a word, uh, my example was bone equals bake plus phone. Now we know that bone and bake uh, start with the same initial. So you, by looking up the, the, the Fangqi initial spellers in the Cheyun, you can build up these chains. And this is uh, two examples of, of doing this. So uh, you see on the left, uh, we have a character uh, 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 chick. And then its uh, speller is uh, this next character. Wait, am I doing this right? Uh, it, well, I, I'm not totally sure. But in any case, the, the point is, uh, is simple, which is <clears throat> that the thing on the left is one chain you get. So if you, if you look up one of these characters in the Cheyun, it uses one of the other characters as its initial speller. And then if you look up that one, it uses it as its initial speller and you get this chain. So you know all of the characters on uh, the left have uh, the same initial. And similarly, you know all of the characters on the right have the same initial. Now, at this sort of level of abstraction, if you're just looking things up in the Cheyun, you have no idea, you know, is that initial a P or is it a G? You have no idea. You just know the things on the left have the same initial and the things on the right have potentially a different initial than the things on the left, but they have the same initial as all the things on the right. So now is where we bring in the rhyme tables, which you get in the footnotes, where I point out that, uh, so we have the, the asterisk footnote. This is uh, this character that's pronounced something like Chang. So if we look it up in the Yunjing, we're told that it has a voiceless affricate initial. And uh, if we look it up in the uh, in, in the uh, Qiyin Lue, we are told that it has the so-called Zhao initial. Okay. So so now we have some phonetic information. We can say, okay, well, we know that this second character on the left started with a voiceless affricate. And we, we therefore know that all the characters on the left started with a voiceless affricate because we know they all have the same initial, right? And then if we look at the characters on the right, you see the, the dagger footnote, and you see that um, uh, this character is on a different page of uh, the Yunjing. And it's also described as having a voiceless African. And it's also described as having the, the Zhao uh, uh, initial. So this is a, a curious situation, right? Which is that, that the, the Cheyun distinguishes these two chains of initials, which is why I've written them as C1 uh, and C2. But the rhyme tables don't distinguish them. They say they're both voiceless affricate. So now we, we have to ask ourselves like, well, uh, um, is it just a, a, a coincidence? Because uh, it could be that the Cheyun splits these two chains. Uh, or is there some kind of merger that's happened between 602 and, uh, and the 12th century. So now uh, I'll go through, and I think it, 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 you know, at the risk of being tedious, I think it's worth doing exactly the same exercise with this chart. So now we're looking at, uh, you know, 
at the first level of abstraction, just other initial chains. Yeah, because because from within the Che Yun itself, we have no information about how any of this stuff was actually pronounced. Like, uh, I mean, we, we have a we have an incredible lot of information about the interrelationship of how different characters were pronounced. But in order to actually kind of apply a model to it in terms of uh, you know articulatory or acoustic phonology, we don't have an in from with inside the the Che Yun. So we look at these uh, Fanchi initial speller chains, and we get you know all the ones on the left are in one chain, and all the ones on the right are in another chain. And then we look up those the characters and 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 uh, sort of an aside here. Uh, this also shows you that there are many, many, many more characters in the Cheyun than in the rhyme tables. The rhyme tables only give one character per syllable type, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so in general, in a Fangqi chain, you'll only find one of its characters in the rhyme tables. So we try to look up uh, the characters on the left. Uh, in the rhyme tables, and we only find uh, the last one. Uh, and then you look at the star, and it says that uh, the Yunjing says this is a, a, an, an initial liquid resonant. And uh, the Qi Yunle says that it has the so-called Lai initial. Um, now, if we look in the right, we try to look up those characters. Uh, we um, we uh, similarly uh, find only one of them in the um, uh, in the rhyme tables, which is the second to last one, and then we find that it's also described as a uh, liquid resonant uh, in the Yunjing and as the Lai initial in the uh, Qi Yun Lue. So, so how far have we gotten so far? We've looked at four initial uh, or four Fanche initial speller chains. And uh, so these two and these two. And what we figured out is that these two chains are distinct in the Cheyun, but they're linked in the rhyme table. And we figured out that these two are distinct in the Cheyun, but they're linked in the rhyme tables. Now, oh, I don't really go into it, <clears throat> but um, what we can do next is kind of try to come up with some theory about, let's say, the phonological system. And in this case, you, there, let me see if we have a clear example. Yeah, yeah, okay. Look at the um, the second example on the uh, left and the third example on the right. And you see that they have the same rhyme category, which means that they're a minimal pair in terms of phonological analysis, right? So, so we can say from within the Cheyun, they have distinct uh, initials, but the same rhyme. So they're a minimal pair. So then as a discipline, we say, okay, in this case, we will speculate that the Cheyun had two kinds of voiceless affricate initials that were later merged in the rhyme tables. But if we look at, at this case, uh, I leave it uh, to the uh, to, to, to the audience, yeah, to the to you, but there there is no rhyme on the left and on the right in common. So this means that although uh, the Cheyun distinguishes two kinds of Ls, we can regard those two kinds of Ls 
as uh, as allophons and not as phonemes because there's no minimal uh, pair, right? So in this case, if you like, we agree with the rhyme tables and not with the rhyme books. That's not maybe the, the best way to formulate it, but I think you see what, what I mean, which is um, um, one way of putting it is we start from the categories that the primary source gives us, and what it gives us is um, these, these uh, onset speller chains. And then we ask ourselves, well, what is the phonetic interpretation of these onset speller chains? And we can do that with recourse to the rhyme tables, find out things like, oh, uh, these two are uh, voiceless affricates, and these two are, um, are uh, liquid resonance. Uh, and then we want to ask ourselves, okay, but how many initial phoneme, you know, uh, contrasts are there in Middle Chinese? And for that, we can look at the patterns of complementary distribution with the rhymes. And we can say, well, in the case of these two Fanche initial speller chains that we know represent voiceless affricates, they, con they contrast in Middle Chinese. So they're two different phonemes. And uh, when it comes to these laterals, we know they don't contrast. So we don't need to call them two different phonemes. And if you apply this kind of an analysis across you know, the board, uh, let's say at least one solution you might come up with is uh, this one, which is the standard solution. So these are the initials of uh, Middle Chinese. We have uh, Qing is clear, right? So, uh, so it has a kind of let's say. So each of these words has a a, a, a non-technical meaning, right? Yeah. So where I've said uh, you know uh, voiceless, the actual term is clear, and then the one for voiced is actually is muddy, and um, and so on, right? Uh, and the the. The question is, how do we kind of know what those terms mean? I, I think that what I would say is that the, the space of options is not vast, right? Like how many manners of articulation are there in attested human languages? We somehow have to map those onto uh, our analysis of what these terms meant in, in Chinese historical, in the philological tradition. Um, and uh, an analysis that is kind of I don't know, less exotic uh, would be um, preferred. So if someone said like, oh, I think that the muddy initials are implosive and the, and the Qing initials are ejectives or something, I would say, well, it's, you have to, you know, <laughs> you, you, the, the burden of, ev you know, the, 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 the onus is on you to, to, to argue for why you think those are implosives or those are uh, ejectives. Um, well, I would say this is like in this particular case, it's because it, we, from the other book, we have it saying laimu, right? So, so, so that's where you kind of take just a little glance at Chinese dialectology and you say like, well, in you know, in in almost all Chinese dialects, the character Lai is pronounced with a lateral initial. So, um, so, and then you say, is there a reason why the Yunjing would call it clear muddy? And I think, I mean, so, I think what I'm about to say is right, which is I think is a standard analysis. But uh, basically, the resonance didn't fall as because there wasn't a contrast. In voicing in Middle Chinese in resonance, uh, th th they couldn't. They didn't, you know, split into clear and and muddy, uh, analytically speaking. So they said, ah, it's the clear, clear muddy, and, and and then used used the fact that there wasn't a distinction in that class as a name for that class. That's I think the the reasoning. Um, but uh, but one thing you kind of uh, have pointed out is that the interpretation of 
these um, categories does you know cast an eye at actually how characters are pronounced in 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 um, uh, in uh, Chinese dialects and and in um, like like Bernard Cogren is the person who really worked on this in terms of like moving uh, in the 1920s moving from purely talking in categorical terms right where if you're a Qing phon phonologist you don't you don't care you say oh this is the laimu and and you're done yeah uh, whereas uh, um, if you tr if you want to think about the articulatory or acoustic phonetics of this stuff or write them in a in an alphabet you have to you know tie into international uh, analyses and Carl Grin's the first one who really did that and um, and he did it uh, with reference to uh, Chinese dialects and particularly I think sino-japanese readings um, and, and, yeah and um, I think in my presentation I'm trying to emphasize how little you need to do that in order to, to show kind of the independence of the philological sources as, as sources. Uh, and I think I'm doing that in part to answer the kind of critique um, of, um, of that we talked about yesterday of Pulley Blank and Koblen, which is like, well, look, if you have to look at dialects anyhow, you might as, actually, you might as well actually just, just apply historical linguistics to the dialects in a rigorous comparative way. Uh, and and I think that, you know, in, in order to, to to sort of counter that critique, I'm trying to, to really emphasize how little you need to look at modern pronunciations of Chinese. But, you know, of course, we don't want to develop an analysis of the Chinese philological sources that are wildly inconsistent with the reality of uh, how Chinese is is spoken on the ground. Um, how can I say it? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to present the orthodox view on this, which is that uh, we know that Middle Chinese only had four tones because uh, the Cheyun is organized into volumes by those four tones. Um, I mean, there, like, like, and also he's responding to an, an earlier research tradition um, uh, of of analysis of how many tones there are. And this is in my book somewhere, but I think that uh, the categorization of the of, of Chinese as having four tones um, uh, starts in around the second century. So uh, what the the what the orth what the field thinks is the reason why tones weren't mentioned before the second century is because Chinese did not have tones before the second century. And the reason why uh, Chinese was discussed as having four tones from the second century, you know, in, kind of from the second century on, but let's say for our purposes, from the second century into the, the Sui dynasty when the Cheyun was written, is because in fact Chinese had four tones during those uh, centuries. So you're completely right that, that if you look at the phonetic reflexes of characters in these categories in modern Chinese dialects, in most cases, the Qing uh, Zhuo distinction will have something to do with tones. But uh, what we think is that's a secondary effect having to do with uh, tonal splits induced by uh, differences of voicing uh, of, of, of manner of manner contrasts on the initial. Uh, because you will usually get, um, uh, where I mean, let's say, if you look at the standard analyses of these things, you, you, you will usually see more than four tones uh, and, and it, that it will be possible to analyze all those dialects that, that have a Qing Zhuo tonal contrast as having in some sense eight tones, you know, with, with possible neutralizations. So I think that's strongly kind of indicative that uh, the, the the sort of orthodox tradition that I'm pointing at is uh, is right. Um, th there are people who analyze old Chinese as having tones, 
uh, and but I don't think there's anyone who analyzes old Chinese as having tonal contrasts uh, along the Qing versus Zhuo uh, distinction. There are people who analyze Middle Chinese in that way. Okay, so now we want to come up with the divisions. Okay, so I've been doing something that uh, that I hope everyone follows, which is I translate uh, Deng. When we're talking about the rhyme tables as rank, and where uh, when we're talking about the rhyme books as division, in order to emphasize that they are not the same thing, and I think it's extremely confusing that uh, the Chinese, you know, that the Chinese uses the same term for them. Yeah, and this is not my idea. It's not my choice of terminology. It comes from this fellow uh, O. Uh, who uh, wrote the, the, I think, wrote the article in the Brill Encyclopedia of Chinese Language and Linguistics about division. Uh, and then uh, just a kind of word of warning that there's a new book out by uh, 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 Zhong Weisheng about Chinese historical phonology uh, with uh, uh, Cambridge, um, where he uses the terms in exactly the opposite way. So, so he uses division for the rhyme tables and he uses rank for the rhyme books. And I think what a catastrophe, like why did he do that? Um, but uh, let's say I'm sticking with the way O did it. And I, in any event, think that it's a very useful distinction. So let's now explore what that is. We've already discussed that in the, in the, in the rhyme tables, division you know, I'm taking as just means something physically about the page formatting of the book itself. Yeah. So now we move from uh, rank to division. So uh, step one, this uh, guy, uh, Zhang Yon, in, uh, in the, you know, in, in, the, in the 18th century, mostly, he looked up the characters in uh, each uh, Che Yun rhyme category to see which rank the rhyme tables put them in. Okay, and what did he find? He found that the rhyme categories of the Cheyun divide into four classes. Those rhymes that contain characters appearing only in rank one. Those rhymes that contain characters appearing only in rank two. You, you, uh, yeah, and then here is where I was going to say, now you think, oh, this is pretty going to be pretty uninteresting, yeah? No, it gets more exciting when we get to the third category. Those rhymes that contain mostly characters that appear in rank three, but also contain characters appearing in rank two and rank four, and those rhymes that contain only characters put in rank four. So uh, these are the divisions of the Cheyun, right? And you see how they are very explicitly different than the ranks of the Yunjing. Uh, and why are they different? Because of the messy third category. That something that's division three could be rank two, or something that's division three could be rank four. Okay. And yes, and, and then I want to make this very important sort of analytical uh, uh, distinction, which is that there are no divisions in the Cheyun, right? Uh, uh, they're a, a, a hybrid sort of analytical beast that combines rhyme categories of the Cheyun with the ranks of the rhyme tables. So, so like you think of it this even in terms of chronology, like they're, they're, they're this kind of um, entanglement of information from 602 with information from the 12th century in this very complicated way. So I think it's just necessary 
to to keep that very squarely in mind because you 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 are always tempted to sort of uh, reify these things and say like well how was the second division pronounced and it's like well you know you can't have a thing that was pronounced in two different centuries at the same time so uh, so we need to keep in mind how constructed these categories are as abstract analytical categories yeah so um, that's step one of of coming up with the divisions now the realization that the div divisions uh, as we've just defined mostly coincide with distributional classes of initials allows one to redefine the divisions using co-occurrence patterns of initials rather than referring to uh, the rhyme table ranks, which is to say, from a methodological perspective, as I just explained, I am unhappy with uh, this definition of the divisions because it, it's this weird combination of you know, information about the page formatting of books in the, in the 12th century and uh, a kind of uh, the distributional or, or and rhyme categories in uh, the Cheyun. So I'm trying to find a way of paraphrasing uh, the categories found in entirely Cheyun internal manners. Yeah, and it turns out we can basically do that uh, by making reference to initials. Or from from the from the Cheyun perspective, by, by making reference to uh, Fanchi initial speller chains, right? So let's do it. Um, the so yeah the 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 thing I want to emphasize uh, first because there's actually a kind of uh, mistake in my book that uh, that. Um, that Zev Handel points out in his in his review, um, I'm going to we're going to be looking at like what look like complementary distributions, but they're only complementary distributions because we're restricting the class of initials we're looking at. So we're only looking at the dentals and the affricates and the fricatives. Uh, sorry, the the retroflexes. We're not looking at the velars and the labials. Yeah. So uh, so I, that's an important caveat. Uh, for me to put in that I didn't have in the book uh, enough uh, and made a mistake. But let's uh, just say we're looking at the compatibility of the, the divisions with uh, the divisions as we've just defined them, yeah, uh, in this way I'm unhappy with, with um, uh, co occurrence patterns of different initials. Okay. And then you see what you see, which is to say, like uh, the limu occurs in uh, division one, three, and four, and the dentals only in division one and four, and the retroflex in division two and three, and the the affricate in division one and four, and the palatals only in division three, and the palatal retroflexes only in division two, and the point that I want to make right now is, okay, this may not yet seem super elegant or meaningful. It's just a fact about the world, yeah. But it's already allowed us to uh, define the divisions with respect to the Cheyun, right? Because rather than uh, defining uh, division four as uh, those characters that occur in rank four in the uh, rhyme tables, we can define division four as those rhymes that uh, co-occur with uh, the, the, the dental and affricate initials, but not the retroflex initials. You see that like, like you might well ask why we want to bother doing this at all, yeah. In terms of like, you know, wh wh why do we want these divisions, yeah? But uh, let's set that question aside for a minute and instead say my goal, kind of methodologically speaking, is to try and pin our theories 
of, uh, of all Chinese uh, historical phonology to the oldest, most comprehensive sources. So I want to kind of leave the rhyme tables behind and only stick with the rhyme books. And these distributional classes allow us to, to, to offer new definitions of divisions in Middle Chinese uh, that do that. Uh, with, uh, with an exception, however, which is you notice that the dentals and the, um, and the affricates cannot be, uh, or the, the, the divisions, yeah, yeah, here's how to put it. The division one and division four cannot be distinguished on the grounds of uh, co-occurrence classes with different initials. Uh, so that uh, means that, let's say, uh, we, we can forget about division, uh, the distinction between division one and, and four and say that there's, a, there's kind of only three divisions, yeah? Um, and that they are division one slash four, division two, and division three. But if you just do that, and I sort of ask you to do it, I should have had an extra slide, but I've asked you to do it in your mind, you say, okay, then I just, uh, let's say, cross out the first row. Uh, what you then notice is that division two and division four are in complementary distribution. So we can, in terms of co-occurrence classes with initials, at no loss of information, replace the analysis of four divisions with only two classes, type A and type B. So I'm just gonna paraphrase that, which is, um, from the perspective of the distributional classes of the Cheyun itself, which is Middle Chinese, the analysis of four divisions and the analysis of two types are both compatible. Now, and it's basically a, a matter of taste, which one you want to go with. Uh, but as a, as a fact about the way the discipline works, uh, basically everything after uh, the Cheyun, we talk about divisions, whereas there's a tendency when talking about things before uh, to talk about the A B distinction, uh, and 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 that makes sense, right? Because the 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 source material for Middle Chinese kind of presents, like especially the the rhyme tables, uh, uh, presents these four ranks. So you know people talk about, oh well, how is rank four different than rank one? But the further back in time you go, uh, the, the divisions and the ranks don't matter because. Uh, the, because that con because all of the contrasts that we're talking about can be understood uh, in a simpler terms as uh, the A B distinction. So for the for the rest of the course, we'll be hearing a lot about A versus B, uh, but not that much about the ranks and divisions. Okay. Yes, I think we can do that, but then we might not be able to have the AB distinction. Yes, I mean, actually what I was thinking about, which is the kind of thing you're talking about, but not the exact example you're talking about, is we do have examples of Laimu with uh, division two, I think two characters, I think something like that. Yeah. So, um, so the um, uh, just a second. So the, the 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 this the what I would say is yes, we ignore stuff like that. Like if something's sufficiently rare, we ignore it. Um, but the um, but you know you, you don't ignore these things all the time. So um, for instance, I just happen to know about um, uh, because because uh, Gong Shun has written a blog post about it. Um, one of these examples of a um, 
of a Division II uh, L initial character uh, is actually the Lan in Anlushan. Sorry, the Lu in Anlushan. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Anlushan was probably uh, Sogdian. Uh, and and you get uh, so, which is to say, An Lushan is not a Chinese name. It's probably actually the same name as Roxanne, um, uh, which is a Sogdian name. Yeah. Uh, so these so so there is also a tendency that these kind of really weird characters, like like characters that occupy basically empty phonetic uh, positions, are late. Uh, with in in terms of you know the epigraphical record, and are used to write foreign words. So, uh, I mean, let's say, don't take my word for it. Uh, that would be an interesting you know thing to read a paper about or something like 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 what or what what you know what is the philological dimension of uh, kind of characters that uh, that represent what should be non-existing syllables. Uh, but I would say my impression is that overall. It's okay to 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 um to ignore them, not just because they're rare, but because they're rare and late and tend to write sound tend to be used for exactly those situations where someone might find themselves trying to uh, write something impossible, right? Like for instance, in English we would say you know Q always is followed by U, except when it's not, uh, <laughs> and when it's not, it's being used for Arab words, for example, because they're because we're trying to use uh, the Roman alphabet to, to represent sounds that aren't normally represented. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a sort of socio-historical question. Um, but what I would say is, you let, let, let's think of it this way. Can, could you motivate the type A, type B distinction without ever mentioning the existence of rhyme tables? That's, that, would be a, uh, that's, that would be fun. That would be a fun thing to try to do. Uh, and if so, you know, then I'm happy to agree with you and say that, uh, that, that, it, that, that the discipline of Chinese historical phonology with respect at least to the very origins of, of, of the language in Sino-Tibetan, 2602, uh, we should only talk about uh, divisions and forget, sorry, only talk about types and just totally forget about divisions. I would be okay with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, some of you are immediately thinking like, but, 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 but you're going to talk about division two and the R hypothesis and what I, yeah, yes, we'll get to all that. But, but I think like, well, it's maybe it can be done without uh, analysis of divisions. And maybe that would make for an overall more elegant uh, presentation. You know, I mean, th I think there is a tension in all academic disciplines, but I would say, especially in old Chinese historical phonology of how much do you stick with tradition? Because on the one hand, if you don't stick with tradition at all, your your analysis and your writing will be unintelligible to other people working in the discipline. But on the other hand, I think there's a tendency, um, or I mean, so I apologize for, for a slight uh, digression, but I, I was a math major for a while. And one thing that I noticed in math is like, the moment someone comes up with a better, shorter proof, everyone ignores all previous work on that problem yeah like the 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 discipline loves to forget about its own past at least in terms of how it's talked to undergraduates and that made me feel very sad as a as a as a as a mathematician as, as a as a mathematics undergraduate right because i think like what, think of all these poor mathematicians who pour their lives into you know slightly less elegant proofs who now we ignore right but when i started doing chinese historical phonology i felt like we have the opposite problem which is we make all students re-experience every mistaken idea <laughs> and every inefficient formulation since the you know middle of the 19th century until now. Yeah. So there's all this discussion about like, well, uh, Carlgren was wrong to distinguish you know four types of Ys or something like that. It's like, well, who cares? You know, let's talk about what's true rather than what Carlgren was wrong about. 
Um, and 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 that is one of the things I've tried to do in my book is to kind of is to kind of by focusing in on the primary sources to kind of forget some of the baggage of the history of the discipline. Uh, but as you can tell, I've only been semi successful at that and um, <laughs> and look forward to, you know, us all together collaborating on finding the most efficient, uh, concise, uh, clear and empirical presentations of, of, of the actual knowledge of Chinese historical phonology that we have. Let's just say I entirely sympathize. Yeah, this is just kind of what it's what it's like doing Chinese historical phonology. But I would say I'm trying to do two things. Uh, I'm trying to kind of um, make it clear what the uh, what structures are imminent to the primary sources, right? So we can say like in the rhyme tables, there's a thing called ranks, yeah. And we can say like in the rhyme books, there's a thing that's, that's actually part of the presentation of the document, homophon groups, right? And then, then to explore the, the less directly um, observable, but still genuinely there categories, yeah? Like what, what are the relationships of complementary distribution between different classes of initials and different classes of rhymes. Those are, those are facts about the presentation of the language that, that, are, that were being presented by the, uh, the Cheyun, that the Cheyun itself didn't um, showcase, right? So I would say one point is just to figure out what structures we, we have there, yeah? And, and that that can, we can understand as a, as a kind of, I don't know, scientific project in its own right, uh, setting entirely aside the question of the phonetic interpretation of these categories. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, we're looking at, we're looking at the, the phonotactics of Middle Chinese while trying to be quite um, open-minded about the phonetic interpretation of the categories we're working with. Now, okay. I think that you know, uh, th there's there's a more abstract way of doing this than I've even done it, right? Because I've said sort of capital T, right? Whereas that's not in the book, yeah. Um, but I think that's safe in terms of like like it's not sort of overly um, uh, art, sort of artificially realistic. Uh, uh, and can just be thought of as an arbitrary label for that category, right? but it's a one we've chosen for heuristic reasons. Yeah. Now the 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 question you might you know well be asking is like why don't we come up with terms for the divisions and the a, a b distinction that also have that kind of heuristic of you know implying a, a phonetic interpretation? And I would say that well you know uh, we uh, you know you're welcome to do that. Um, but what we are coming up to slowly is um, what are the phonetic interpretations of these categories. And before we determine that, we, we, I think it's good to have the indeterminacy in focus. Uh, and like, it, it, let's say this is a, I don't know, this is maybe kind of we're just counting the angels that are on the heads of pins here, but like Guillaume Jacques likes to do everything in the IPA. He writes Middle Chinese in the IPA, he talks about the, the the interpretation of the initials in the IPA, and I think that that is like is 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 fine. You know, it's not gonna no one's gonna die from it, yeah. But it it it, it has a tendency to seduce us into thinking that things are more knowable than they in fact are, and it tends to bring out of focus the 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 the, the labor necessary on all of our parts. To, to know that we know what we're talking about, if you like. With all of that said, there's also a concrete issue, which is the AB distinction, actually, you will be unhappy to hear. We don't really have a good handle on what its phonetic interpretation is in Old Chinese, but it matters immensely. Like all sound laws basically operate differently if you're talking about type A syllables or type B syllables. So you just can't formulate 
any sound changes uh, in the history of Chinese without reference to type A and type B. Uh, when I just wanted to indicate this kind of internal reconstruction of, of, of Middle Chinese that I was talking about, where we can notice things like um, there's no, uh, I'll call it H, although it was probably actually a gamma, uh, in type B syllables, and there's no G in type A syllables. So then we can just speculate that the H is some kind of lenited uh, form of the G. And, and, and I'm presenting this at this moment just to show you kind of the kind of internal reconstruction we do, not to, to, to propose this uh, concretely, uh, which I'll do when we go through the initials of Old Chinese. And uh, just give you another indication uh, of, of doing the same sort of thing in terms of improving rhyming in the churging. So, um, so, so this is a hypothesis that a certain vowel in Middle Chinese, which you can think of as ah, comes from ra. And then I will just point out that in, in Ode 2.2, we get a rhyme between ak and ak. And uh, in Ode 3.3, we get a rhyme between ang and ang. So the hypothesis that a ah comes from ra would improve uh, uh, this. So, um, so that's again just uh, I'm you know going back to the very beginning, just saying we internal recon, in, re, internally reconstruct uh, Middle Chinese in a way that uh, improves the analysis of the churching. And now, uh, bringing the Shisheng series into conformity with the Shisheng hypothesis. Uh, oh, I don't give an example. Oops. Um, okay, and then uh, this will become very methodological, but. Actually, so, so, some of the questions sort of um, so, so, some of the questions sort of touched on, it, which is, do we really have to do things this way? You know, like <laughs> it seems a little bit tortured. And I just want to point out that in mathematics, we oftentimes define the attributes of something. For instance, the integers, you know, one and two and three, they're they 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 they're a set that's closed under addition and subtraction, uh, for example. Um, and then we can abstract away and look at all objects that have those properties. So I want to suggest that as a discipline, we take this approach uh, with uh, historical Chinese phonology. So now we look at what, oh, I'm already over time. Just stick with me like a few more seconds. What are the, the roles that the evidence play? So the rhyme, um, yeah, uh, this actually isn't quite right, but the rhyme tables, what is their function? Their function is supplying phonetic interpretations. So I call that alphabetizing, but they only do it for very, very few characters. So what is the purpose of the rhyme book? I call it transitivizing. It's, it's telling you which other characters you can apply those same interpretations to, okay. So then I just want to point out that, that there are other primary sources we could look to for these two actions. For instance, Han Dynasty Chinese transcriptions of Indic Buddhist terms could be used as alphabetizers, or Tang Dynasty Tibetan transcription, Tibetan, like, uh, alpha, al, Tibetan alphabet representations of Chinese words, Bakpa script in the Yuang Dynasty. These are all things that can be used as alphabetizers. And then there are other transitivizers like uh, peron, per, uh, peronomastic glosses from the Shirming and uh, Fanche uh, from, from other books, from, from the Yupian, from the uh, uh, Jingdian Sherwen. And, um, and I think that uh, Old Chinese phonology has too much obsessed on specific alphabetizers and specific transitivizers. And we should systematically explore you know, what happens if we use uh, different ones uh, and make things more explicit, like whose analysis of Shijing rhymes um, and, uh, and whose analysis of Shisheng series. And now, of course, this, would, this becomes overwhelming in terms of data, which is why we should use uh, explicit formal models and uh, digital 
uh, representations of these sources, I think. And so that's kind of what, where I wanted to end in terms of sketching a kind of future of Chinese historical phonology where, where we, we explored in the same way that has been done for the rhyme books and the rhyme tables, uh, the complete uh, uh, body of available evidence. I think that's a methodological thing, which is like if, if you have two assumptions, uh, go with the simpler one. So, you know, f find me an, a circumstance in which it would be beneficial to understand the initial feng shui speller as containing a minor syllable, and I'll be convinced. I think that, that, that particularly the, the earliest feng shui would be a place to look for that. You know, I'd be fine. But... But I do think that, like, it's clear that by Middle Chinese, we're dealing with monosyllabic, uh, let's say, monosyllabic morphemes. Uh, although I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, the, the the morphological analysis isn't the point. The categories that the Cheyun works in are monosyllables. Let's put it that way. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, I, the short answer is no, and I'll just tell you my own feeling is that uh, we shouldn't. Do that, and 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 uh, you know uh, very succinctly, I would say at the moment computers can do two things: they can logically reason by you know uh, symbolic manipulation, uh, and they can have intuition, and that's what artificial intelligence is: is intuition. You sh you you show a computer you know uh, millions of pictures of 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 penguins, and then you show it a new picture, and you say. Is this a penguin? You have no idea how it's making a decision. Uh, and you just rely on its intuition. And the, the reason, the way that human beings are still different than computers is a human being can switch seamlessly between logic and intuition and can, can kind of try to pin down their intuition and logic and whatnot. Uh, whereas a computer, you can either ask it be logical or you can ask it be intuitive. And at the, at the moment, I think uh, Chinese historical phonology would benefit from more logic and less intuition. So that's why I think things like finite state transducers are useful is to actually make our, our hypotheses extremely explicit and test them symbolically to force us to do things like, like uh, say exactly which order sound changes happen in. And I think for, for, for that sort of thing, artificial intelligence is just not helpful. Uh, the answer is yes. So um, the the point that, gosh, how do I put it? The point that I'm trying to make, though, is that that distinction, if it's in the Cheyun, uh, cannot be recovered kind of qua division. Does that make sense? Like that that. If you're trying to paraphrase ranks as divisions, you cannot separate uh, the first and the fourth division using uh, Cheyun internal evidence. Okay. So, so it's just a fact about what information is in the Cheyun and what information isn't in the Cheyun. Uh, 